Hello and welcome back. Today I'd like to know what's not to love about Canada. I mean, they got great geographical landscapes, maple syrup, hockey, and mob hits. You know, basically something for everybody. Outside of us, the criminal history community, I'm not sure everyone associates organized crime with Canada as much as we do. But Canada has a whole smorgasbord of interesting and polarizing criminal figures and today, we're going to explore one of their nastiest mobsters. A man who was known for taking hits without bias, and that man was Salvatore Colati. He was dispersed between multiple families. I tried and tried, but I could not find an exact, accurate birth date for Salvatore. But he was born in 1971 or very early 1972. In fact, I scoured several sources with info on him, and it did not lay out much before his involvement in organized crime. There isn't much to go on regarding his younger years and upbringing. As always, if you happen to have some info, please send it my way. I would be appreciative of that, as I'm always thankful for some enlightenment. As far as I could find, he started his criminal ventures in his teenage years when he became somewhat of a debt collector for the Canadian mob in the Toronto and the Woodbridge areas. Even during his teen years, he wasn't massive by any means, but he was stout with a temper that could rival that of a starved lion. That alone made him stand out to the older and more experienced individuals who understood that in order to survive in that underworld, you must be comfortable with extreme acts of violence and obviously, Sal was more than capable and willing. After settling into adulthood, Sal wound up with three children of his own. He also established himself in the food industry, opening his own restaurant business. However, Sal was known to rip off suppliers and creditors as he had a habit of not paying his bills. Not only that, but when confronted with non-illicit debts, he would threaten everyday citizens whom he did business with, which obviously added to his greedy and violent reputation both in the criminal and the professional world. It's safe to say he probably wasn't picking up the tab for anybody. He wasn't empathetic and he certainly didn't believe in incentive. He is not someone that I would have tipped either. You know, scratch his back but he'll shoot you in yours kind of a thing. So word around town is that Sal is stiff you and he might kill you if confronted. And by the 1990s, there was little to no doubt about his reputation as he was now a known killer. Salvatore Colati wasn't loyal to one family. He was loyal to money, which helped feed his degenerate gambling habits. And because of that, he worked for whoever wanted to pay him and he killed whoever he was paid to kill. There wasn't much of a gray area to him. If someone from one of the families wanted someone else to go away, well, they knew they had an ace in the hole who would take the hit without any discrimination or opposition. And you know what? I think that gets lost in mob lore on TV and film sometimes, that these guys really weren't loyal. As much as I've read and heard about Omerta, I've also read and heard about just as many guys turning state's evidence against their so-called friends and associates or killing them. I think that's pretty consistent a lot of gang culture in general. I mean, you watch the first 48 and the guy that probably swore he would never say a word starts crying as soon as he gets put in an interview room over a crime he was involved in. I'm also not saying people can't feel guilt or remorse, but I am saying that the deeper I've dug into criminal history through all landscapes, not just mafias and gangs, but all criminal types snitch and show no loyalty when things are no longer in benefit to them. That's a massive part of the criminal personality that I've picked up on, and maybe that's a subjective opinion of my own, but honestly, I've seen it too. For quick context, I certainly wasn't innocent my whole life. But I'm not going to try and sell you this idea that I was the baddest guy around or a gang member or a hardened gangster, but I made mistakes. Some of the guys I grew up around were very violent and criminally motivated individuals, but I never got that deep into things. I committed petty crimes until I was around 22 years old. I grew up around guys that were far worse than me. And I'm no longer friends with a single one of them anymore that stuck to that lifestyle. Ultimately because they're selfish, not because I think I'm better than who I used to be or where I came from. I knew a guy real well who was a career criminal and now he's serving life sentences after executing someone close to him, all because he didn't get his way, as he wanted to see people on his level and this was after getting people arrested by just being present with him in other instances. I won't go into any more details as I'm still close to some of the people that were affected by this guy. I've also known plenty of people that wanted nothing to do with me anymore once I had a child and began living a so-called straight and narrow life too. And guess what? I'm perfectly fine with that. See, most of the money I ever earned through cutting corners the illicit way wound up going to lawyers, court fees, and government forced probationary programs. That fast money will be gone just as fast as it came in, 
at least in my experiences. Anyways, that's a little bit about me, but back to our neighbor from the north's very own accomplished hitman, Salvatore Kaladi. So again, by the 90s, Sal was doing hits and folks were getting clipped like loose paper. In 1991, one of his most high profile executions took place. A man named Giovanni Costa, who wasn't a criminal or a major player in the Canadian Mafia and drug trade, wound up his victim. See, Costa's family was involved in a drug war with the rival Camisio family, who were originally getting along until they both decided they wanted full control of the trafficking pipelines. Because of that, Giovanni Costa, 38, was shot dead near his home allegedly by Sal Calati and possibly an accomplice around the Thornhill area. He was basically just a residual tragic casualty of war. The feud originally began when the younger brother of Giovanni, Luciano Costa, broke into the house of a rival mobster, both stealing weapons and taking a leak all over his bed, which ultimately led to the previous deaths of two other Costa brothers. This information came directly from Giuseppe Costa, brother of those previously mentioned who was interviewed in a maximum security prison. Later, in 1996, Sal was suspected in the execution of Francesco Luiero, who owned a Toronto bakery. See, Carmine Guido, who was a mobster and informant, had some recordings that implicated Salvatore Collati in the death of Francesco. Guido had a taped conversation with Pino Asino, in which Asino said that he warned Francesco not to press and bother Salvatore Collati, even though Collati scammed thousands of dollars away from someone related to Francesco. Francesco didn't listen, and he confronted Sal, while also trying to intimidate him, ultimately leading to his own death. In 1997, Giuseppe Congiesta was killed, and again, Collati was suspected and even arrested and charged, but he was eventually acquitted after a witness gave a different description of someone that didn't look like Sal Collati. Salvatore had been suspected in multiple murders, and yet there was never any charges that were able to stick as he was also suspected in the hit of Gatano Pimpinto. Finally, in 2010, one of the most infamous mob hits in Canadian history was set in motion. Nicolo Rizzuto, alleged boss of the Rizzuto crime family, was standing in his home on the afternoon of November 10th, 2010, when a bullet from a sniper was fired, striking him and ultimately leading to the end of his life. That hit, too, was also suspected to be the work of Salvatore Collati. It's widely alleged that Sal bragged about being involved with the hit in Nicolo Rizzuto, but again, he was never found guilty of anything related to the hits he was involved in. But 2013 itself brought on the inevitable as Salvatore Collati ran into karma. On July 12th, overnight at a banquet hall, Collati and his associate James Tusk were near their vehicle when they were shot multiple times at close range. Due to Sal's history of being a paranoid killer, Police believed that Sal knew the shooter or shooters as they didn't appear to be a struggle and it was also hard to sneak up on someone like Sal due to his prepared nature. Their bodies were discovered rather quickly, but the killer or killers were never found and identified. However, it is widely believed that it was revenge ordered by Vito Rizzuto over the death of his father, especially since Sal Calati loved telling people he was responsible for the hit. It's no surprise that this story ended with the central character receiving a toe tag and matching body bag. Sal was a violent man who clearly had problems with impulse. He liked to gamble, and when he lost, he would borrow money and punish those who attempted to settle debts. As I said earlier, he also did this to non-illicit business associates in the restaurant world any time he didn't want to pay for his orders. By the time he was killed, he had no allegiance and there was no loyalty to him either. His funeral didn't garner the usual mob attendance as it's perceived that he had burned too many bridges and no mobsters wanted to be associated with him anymore. He died a violent and somewhat lonely death, which is typical for those who believe it's their duty to play God with the lives of others. As always, thank you for stopping by for another walk into the world of one of the more violent Canadian gangsters, Sal Calati. If you have any thoughts or feelings, please let me know down below, but I ask that you do so respectfully. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, come back soon, and have a great rest of your day.